I'm actually amazed that the in, in this case, the very first conceptualization of the idea actually survived. Like it was, it was not exactly the same thing because it was not uh, one day. Uh, it was not like not, not for a period of one day, it was four days, but it was the same idea. One map, you spend as much time as you want. When you exit, you go to the next period. Like that was here from the beginning. And the other thing that was here from the beginning was there is a sequence of action that you need to do to break the the, the you know the, the 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 cycle and immediately below assassinations like that was like because you, know, uh, you don't change uh, you don't go too far from the tree uh. of course during production at some point you're like yeah what about one more what about one less like each time we try to add remove change that structure somehow put something before after it it it, it broke it somehow while Deathloop may have always had four areas and four times in which to explore them, from my recent chat with game director Dinga Bakaba, it's about the only thing in this game's design that stayed the same throughout the entire production. Here at Noclip we take your feedback incredibly seriously and recently it's come to our attention that many in our community are frustrated by the lack of coverage of games by Arcane Studios. So I just wanted to let you know that we're going to be working really hard to fix that uh, going forward. What are they called? Immersion Sims? Deathloop, the latest title from Arcane Leon Studio, is the game on the tip of everyone's tongue right now. And what's special about it is that it seems to have created a new language for the immersive sim subgenre of games that the studios are known for. Games in which systemic design allow for loads of player choice and terrific moments of emergent gameplay. You know, those times where your actions domino and the end result is something cool and unexpected. But Deathloop is a unique experience, even to fans of immersive sims. And while Dinga didn't want to spill all the beans just yet, he is going to let us in on how many elements of the game came together. Things like the intro, how much help they give the player in highlighting objectives, the style of the game's four maps, and even a melee combat system that was scrapped in favor of a single terrific kick. But first of all, who was the team at Arcane Leon making Deathloop for? Was this for diehard fans who love games like Dishonored and Prey? Players who don't usually finish immersive sims? Or somebody else entirely? But uh, we, we had uh, uh, an ideal playtesters that we were we were talking about, an ideal player sometimes. We, we sometimes even say the ideal player every now and then. And I think with Deathloop, we, we, my, my question was, how can we make the ideal player not the focus, like not the person who will have the most fun with the game? How can we make that a bit more democratic for like a better term? Like you don't need to be in the know. Like everyone sometimes, uh, someone asked us, or was wandering online about this or not, am I playing it the right way was a stab in my heart. Because we do we do everything to make sure that you can play it however you want, we say it, and then people feel guilty. And every time a, a, a review that is a bit harsh or a Steam review would say about this, uh, this is a game that doesn't know what it wants to be, whether it's stealth or combat or, or adventure. What we are trying to solve is when you know the systems and you know the environments, you know the tools, you know all those things, the game is so enjoyable. And how much of a portion of our audience gets to, 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 to that level of familiarity? And that's what we, we are going for. And that's why we are like, okay, let's make something more focused rather than something huge so that you can build that familiarity. Second thing was, okay, let's try to have replayability not being a meta thing, you know, or, but part of the experience. How can you build familiarity before it's the last five minutes of the game and you feel awesome and then the game wraps up? That's 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 more or less how sometimes we see people feel in, in Dishonored or, or Prey streams. Like, I got this figure out and then you play for one hour or something and then it's a wrap. That's where the, 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 the singularity is between uh, the player who will come back and play it again and, and, and really enjoy it. And the one who said, oh, I'll definitely come back. That's a great game. But they don't because we have the lives that we have. Deathloop spends a good three hours explaining how it all works, so I'm not going to attempt to unpack all of that here. But its grand objective, its murder puzzle, as the team calls it, is something truly unique to this game. 
Introductory levels are tricky to design for just about any game, but in Deathloop, there was a lot more to explain than usual. Oh, what was that? Whew. Whew. That was one ridiculous name. Oh, I gotta stop drinking. We needed to teach the mechanics, like in any games. We needed to teach the, the story, the characters, and make you care. We needed you to care for, for someone, and ideally a uh, cult. Then the world presents this weird world. Like we've had some experiences with early playtests uh, uh, in something like Dishonored, where people would actually be off-put by the fact that the world is so different uh, than ours. Like, why does it have to be called an audiograph? Just call it a radio. Like all these things came in playtest and that was sometimes difficult to make choices. So you need to introduce the world in a way that after that you can introduce whatever batshit crazy thing. People will be okay with it uh, if, you, if you do the job right in the beginning. Oh, they just disappeared? That felt too easy. I've done this before, haven't I? So introducing the world and then, and I, I, and I think that's the most difficult thing, was the loop, the campaign, the game structure, the, the, the main story and the rest. Like this, like all these other things, you're like, yeah, that's what you do in most games. But contrary to something like Dishonored, where there was like a dedicated tutorial map, and then there is a couple of mechanics that we introduce in the first maps and even some later on, right? You had a little bit of control on, on, on the player experience to say, yeah, let's make the street so that you have to see this wall of light and deal with it one way or another. Here, <laughs> it was actually very difficult to know what people would do as soon as they are out of the beginning of the, of the game. We need to teach them death loop. Like we need to teach the players death loop. I don't know any damn code. Let's make a strike team for the intro map, you know? And we did that. And then, nah, that's not enough by any stretch of the imagination. Let's add tutorialization now. So there was like the tutorialization, not just the uh, intro, like the tutorialization strike team. And then that became the first three hours uh, strike team. And that became what we ended up calling the guided tour. Uh, and, and, and I think that team did a tremendous job. Uh, like it was a lot of disciplines that needed to be in that strike team for a lot of reasons. Because if you need a new way to tutorialize something, you need UI, you need uh, programming. Like it was not just designers. It was like a, a mini team that was like just hammering on the beginning, like chiseling it like 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 marble, and, and and some folks like playing it, playing through it two times a day, sending pages of hey, yeah, I, I can do it in my sleep. The, the beginning now, I think. Dinga told us they tried every version of this intro possible, from an overly hand-holded version to a from-software style of telling the player absolutely nothing and having them figure it all out. And while some immersive sim fans may crave that type of hands-off approach, he said it was far too frustrating for most. Playtesters would spend far too long trying to solve problems, but when they did, the payoff was incredible. Figuring out how they could reconcile the frustration with this powerful epiphany was a primary focus of the team. Deathloop tells you a lot of things. It has objective markers, it telegraphs where it wants you to go, and catalogs key information on an evidence board. This is very different to the design language of most immersive sims. And according to Dinga, this was all about not bothering the player with too much to unpack themselves. As he said, being aware of the player's cognitive load. Cognitive load is that there is just an amount of information starting, like there is an amount of information uh, of complexity that just makes you feel bad. It's, it doesn't mean you will not get through it. It just makes decision making slower. It, 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 it you know, prevents enjoyment. Too much to handle would be the, 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 the less uh, barbaric term, you know. You know, we have, we, we hold players in high esteem at Arcade. Like we, do not go for, uh, you know, people are dumb, we need to play for them. That's not the case. But there is being smart and there is having pleasure solving something. If you're focusing on this puzzle, like let's just have the player figure out this puzzle right now, while they are also trying to understand how the vision cones work, uh, how your inventory work, while, while they are wondering what happens when they die, like, you see what I mean? You're actually wearing yourself down to the other complexity of the games. And don't worry, halfway through the game, you will have a lot to deal with and you and you feel super smart and, 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 and you know, like 
I got this. Like I'm starting to think with this thing that sounded overwhelming at the beginning, and it feels great. The, the the reality is, yeah, for this to be able to exist, I think it was important that on some other things, it's very clear, very straightforward, and you can focus on the how I do it rather than the what. Speaking of cognitive loads, this is all getting a bit complicated, so how about we sit back and chat about the visual design of this game for a second. We didn't have time to talk to co-creative lead and art director Sebastian Mitton, so we asked Dinga to explain the visuals of Deathloop's four areas, and what design purpose each level was created to satisfy. Uh, I think Updam was the opportunity to make that clash that he was talking about. I want to feel that it's a desolate place. I want to feel that there is a history, that this is a place where people have lived before. So there is this kind of, you know, Northern European feel in the architecture. But I also want the 60s party layer. And that's where all the experimentations with the, the plastic extrusions, uh, like all those really cool, like the, the painted, like all those, a lot of those experiments happened in this district because that's one of the first that happened. You know, that was uh, our vertical slice, so it's one that was pushed uh, the earliest. That's our traditional urban level. That's the shit we like, love to do since, you know, uh, this, uh, Dishonored. Can we make our levels even more sandbox in a way in terms of navigation? This one is actually, I think, the Ryu of our Street Fighter uh, in terms of level. Like that's the one that, that makes all other possible. The complex was, but this is a place that where the nature is very impressive. So, so you know, what if man was, you know, man, human being was not here, but also it's the scientific area, the most scientific area. So it has like the highest contrast in terms of, of technology, like the desolate areas and the, the, the high tech. So that, that was the, the contrast. Freestad Rock. So here we wanted another contrast. We wanted the contrast between the, the very uh, kind of uh, messy area around uh, the bunker, Fias Bunker, and the lavish, elegant uh, club of Frank. And uh, Carl's Bay was, let's crank up the party amusement, uh, entertainment uh, theme here. And the, 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 the buildings are not too high. It, it's one of my uh, favorite invasion maps because the first area here with the, the small houses, you can get on every house and have sometimes some duels running around uh, after one another on the roofs and, and, and trying to, to, to snipe or like that. I, I really like the, the navigation of, of Carl's Bay. Games go under dramatic changes over the course of development, so we asked Dinga to explain one element of the game that changed a lot from what we play today. And his answer was interesting. Deathloop has a terrifically powerful kick, a move that I assumed was a throwback to the terrific kick in Dark Messiah of Might and Magic. But it turns out its origins were a little bit different. The kick got progressively more powerful over the course of development as the team dialed in the engagement distance of combat. And this is because originally Deathloop actually had a melee combat system similar to Dishonored. And the reason it was canned was actually down to multiplayer invasions. That style of combat may have worked, but they had to scrap it because of variances in latency that were different depending on who you were fighting. In the beginning, you could defend with the, the machete uh, and parry and block. Like, uh, like we said, okay, let's just ask ourselves all the questions that just put the, the fencing of Dishonored, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out later. But as soon as we added the multiplayer, something went wrong. The client, which is the invader, has a delay over the host, which you're not feeling when you have hit scan. Uh, bullets because we have like a number of things like, pretty, like there is technology for that blocking uh, was okay but uh, parrying like uh, timed parries uh, were um, problematic and the worst part is yes you can accept it but the problem was switching it was a different timing with the NPCs a different timing from court 
to Juliana and again a different timing, you know, Juliana parrying Colt. Like it was three situations. And I think it was, I think because in Dark Souls there is a difference, but at least there is only really, the monsters are different. Like it's a bit different in Dark Souls. I think we accept it. We know it exists, but we accept it. In Deathloop, it was really hard to accept, like very, very hard, especially when people were used to the, the snappy sting of, of, of this. So then we removed the timed parry and it was only block. And that was boring as hell because suddenly I can turtle and, uh, and fights were like sting, 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 boom. You know, like it was kind of Indiana Jones. So we said, fuck defense. Let's just add, replace defense with a kick, like a big kick that, that makes you go oof. And if it were to trade hits, you would accept it as a player. Like, it's, it's not weird. Like, yeah, I kicked, but it was too late because the, the bache was on me. I, I, I get it. And if it was soon enough, we could break your, your and stun you uh, for a very short time like we did with the... And immediately people accepted it much better in, in playtests. Dinga told me he's been enjoying the past few weeks because he's had a back catalogue of time loop based movies and games that he's finally able to enjoy. I had asked him if Prey's terrific DLC Mooncrash was an inspiration at all in the creation of Deathloop. And he said that while he'd played a couple of hours, he then suddenly realized it was as much a time loop game as it was a roguelike and immediately put it down. But he's excited to complete it soon. So speaking of enjoying himself, I asked how he and the team have reacted to the reviews and player feedback. It's, it's funny because uh, when, when, when reviews started to come up, uh, at first I was, because for some reason I was used to cases where reviews were slow to build up or something, I forgot we sent like a, a ton. So I was like, oh yeah, it's not bad, but it will go down. And then I watched and I, it was like 60 or 70 already. That's where I started running around in this room and jumping and yelling, uh, hopefully my, uh, my neighbors didn't report me, but uh, we are happy. It's better than we, we hoped. We were going for some people will love it, love it. Some people will hate it. No one will be indifferent. That was the goal. And the proportion between the two two groups, like we didn't expect it to be what it is now, which uh, with uh, you know so many people liking it. The one thing that I'm the most pleased that I've read a couple of times, not only in reviews, of course, in, in players' uh, uh, feedback on, on social media and, and, and forums and stuff, it's this is a game where I'm used to play a certain way and I feel all right, you know, to try things differently. Like the fact that people are, were encouraged to, to, to try to play differently and approach the game differently than what they're used to from our past games or games that are, 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 are more or less similar. That was the, honestly, that, that was the best thing I could read like uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a designer. I mean, the difficulty as a designer is how do you prevent people from making a space of possibility a straight line? And uh, I'm happy that, uh, that that worked with this game. I am always succeeding even when I'm not. How do I keep my weapons again? Uh, the infusion process? Isn't that why you came up here? Not gonna lie. Me told me to. You're not the only one with other me's, you know. You're not special. Yeah, but if I succeed... Yeah. If. Good luck. Hey, what's up? Thank you very much for watching this video on Deathloop. Of course, if you want more uh, coverage of arcane games, you can check out our documentary on Dishonored, our documentary on Prey, our documentary on the history of Arcane Studios, which goes into the design of three cancelled games, The Crossing, LMNO, and uh, Half-Life Ravenholm, which is a game uh, just like LMNO, actually, that we uh, premiered, we showed the first ever gameplay of uh, right here on this channel. Uh, we also did, just in case we weren't done with the immersive sim stuff, we also did an episode of our uh, retrospective show, Greatest Hits, on Thief, The Dark Project, uh, which also covers the second and third Thief games and a lot of the Looking Glass Studios, uh, you know, alumni, which uh, sort of bleeds into, you know, Arcane is kind of like the spiritual studio successor to the folks over at LGS. Uh, thank you so much for checking out our channel and for uh, supporting, especially if you're a patron, if you're one of the terrifically named people here uh, beside me who support our work. Uh, we're, you know, endeavoring to mix it up and keep everything fresh during this whole pandemic 
phase. Uh, also, just so you know, you know, doing these like smaller videos closer to launch on a studio doesn't mean that in the future we might not also do a big doc on the game. So if you're looking forward to more on Deathloop, um, we'd certainly love to, to have that opportunity. In fact, let me show you, it came up in our conversation with Dinga. Um, I'm looking forward to hopefully in the future uh, hanging out with him and talking about game design once again. This is what he had to say. You know what is one of the the, the most common things that I've heard, like yesterday, uh, just yesterday, of course. Yeah, we, we, we some of us met uh, to just at least uh, you know yell together a little bit, and uh, I think one of the two or three sentences that I've heard the most was the no clip for this one will be the most interesting, <laughs> and uh, so just dropping it here. So let's save a few bullets in case that happens.